first Google Hangout of the Web Science at MOOC from the University of Southampton. It's slightly disconcerting. We've been having a few technical problems, but we think we're, we're ready to go now. Uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to be joined by some really, really interesting people from all around the world who are going to talk with us and with you about their experience of the web, what the web means to them in their part of the world, in their professional and their maybe personal life, I don't know. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves to you very briefly. And then we have some questions that we want to ask our participants. But if you'd like to send in your own questions, either using the hashtag on Twitter, hashtag FLWebSci, or you can ask questions in the hangout of the Web Science oh. group from the University of Southampton. There's another technical problem. Yes, please carry on, Susan. Okay. By the way, I ought to say, <laughs> of the two of us, this one is Susan Holford, <laughs> Professor Susan Holford, and I'm Professor Leslie Carr. And we're not actually joined at the HIF, although that does rather appear to be the case. Um, so I'm going to ask each of our participants to join um, to introduce themselves um, in turn. So first of all, I'm going to try and go to Norway and to ask you to introduce yourselves to our participants. Hello, Norway. Oh, they've frozen. Well, Norway's frozen. It's very cold in Norway. Let's go <laughs> to Stefan in Montreal. Would you introduce yourself, please? Yes, my name is Stephen Harnad, and I'm physically in Montreal, but I'm virtually in Southampton. Excellent. Uh, I'm a professor of, uh, of um, web science, I guess, at, at Southampton, and of cognitive science at University of Quebec at Montreal. Thank you very much. Sue, from South Korea, perhaps you'd like to introduce yourself next? Hi everyone, my name is Sue Moon. I teach at KAIST uh, in Korea and my research area is online social networks. Thank you very much. And shall we try going to Norway again? Yeah. Hello, my name is Ulrike. Uh, I am not a professor, but I'm working as a project leader on a project called Place Independent Work. And you get a voice from Norway? My name is Gangwal Sturva, I'm a researcher doing a PhD connected to independent work. Okay, thank you. The sound's breaking up a little bit again. Let's go to Stefan in the Lebanon. Oh, now Stefan. we've lost your voice. No, no, turn on your microphone. Stefan, don't meet me. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so my name is Stefan Bazan. I'm in uh, Beirut at San. Right. Oh, okay, we've lost Stefan. Stefan's in Beirut. At, uh, I forget the name of the university in Beirut, and he's uh, also a lecturer in web science. And I'm sure will come back to us shortly. So don't forget, you can send in your own questions by contributing to the group chat on the side of the um, YouTube stream, or else you can tweet us questions with hashtag FL. Web sign. But to get the discussion going, we've got a few questions that we've asked our panel to think about um, before today to give them a little bit of a head start. So the first question we're going to ask everybody is, what is your web? How do you use the web in everyday life and how has that changed over the last 25 years or so? So who should we go to first, Les? Um, shall we try Stephen in Montreal? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I think... 25 years is uh, too short an interval. It was a little bit longer than that, but it's been, uh, I guess it's the web for 25 years and the net for even longer. And there's no question that my, my own life has been completely altered socially, professionally, intellectually uh, by, by that medium. I spend most of my life, I think I spend most of my waking hours in front of the screen now. It's not healthy. I'm not recommending it to anyone else. Um, but, but professionally, I, I uh, now interact with my students and uh, sometimes even uh, often, in fact, give overseas lectures using the web and not a face-to-face -face interaction. And frankly, having just been to a face-to-face -face interaction last night, I, I prefer this. I mean, <laughs> sitting, around, sitting around in a restaurant where, where uh, you can hardly hear one another because of the, the, the uh, echoes and the blare and the music and, and the people that are further down the table, you can't they can't hear what you're saying. I think this is infinitely preferable. Of course, the fade-outs from Norway and the occasional flashbacks from Lebanon make it a little bit bumpy, but I think that'll improve. 
It's not clear whether that's the benefit of technology or the effect of middle age, though, Stephen, is it? Which, which one? Oh, oh, the fact that I've gone so virtual? Yeah. Yes, maybe. Maybe. Let's try um, Sue in uh, Korea. What's the web like for you in Korea? So I think 25 years ago, there was so much boundary. So I think this generation, the young generation, does not remember the tariff structure, for example, in Korea, uh, like anywhere else in the world, except for very big countries. There's the capital and the rest of the world. There's Paris and the rest of France. There's Athens and rest of Greece, the same in Korea, Seoul and the rest, because to make a phone call outside of Seoul, you had to pay extra. Nowadays, mobile phones cost basically the same, but also information flows so freely that you feel less of this information boundary, but at the same time, you have this physical limit of not being then and there and then. So. Uh, this web has enabled us to share information very freely at the same time making the physical lack of physical context all the more acute. So it's like accelerating at both ends. And, uh, and all, every in, you, we get all the information but we are also seeing the damage of having too much information on the web especially like celebrities, their personal life being exposed out there and some uh, say ordinary people, average people being ex catapulted to the front page uh, unintentionally and damaging. So I think we're just being sent to both extreme of information overflow and making the physical uh, lack of physical contact all the more acute but it has been at the moment, uh, at the same time, liberating because we know that whatever information out there, we can get it. Uh, and so it's, I think, has freed the minds of the mankind. Mm. Should we move to, to Norway? I think it might be worth our Norwegians telling the viewers something about where you are because you're not in one of those big cities, are you? No, we are no, a I'm little community with 1,000 inhabitants, so we are actually not in a big city. And <laughs> um, you're quite a long way north as well. Yeah, it's 500 kilometers north from the polar circle. So we have a polar night now, no sun, um, but we are connected with the world, actually we are. Um, for me, uh, I'm from Germany, and uh, 25 years ago I just finished high school, and there was no computers and no internet in the, in the school. Uh, 25 years ago it was about when, uh, when the borders uh, fr between East and West Germany fell down. Uh, so it was a double explosion of uh, connecting to the world. Um, uh, in, my, in my private life, maybe the first big thing was internet banking. It changed uh, my my way to behave and act. And also now I have, uh, I, I stay connected by Skype or other video solutions with my family. Yeah, the thing to buy things and tickets and uh, stuff on the internet is really different now. And if I, it's nearly some of the same options, of course, for me, though I have been I have been brought up in this area, but I think the internet has opened a rural area. I have shops where I can buy Christmas presents. I don't need to travel to the shop to buy it. I do it in internet mostly. Uh, in that sense, I think the, the democracy uh, we have been connected in a way that uh, it's not uh, no problem living where we are living because we reach the world in no time. Actually, last week, uh, Ulrike and me went to Barcelona, meeting 42 countries uh, about co-working. So this way of working, when you are traveling, uh, it's the same if you live in the top of the world, in North Norway, or in Brazil, or what, whatever. 
and it was really interesting meeting a lot of uh, um, participants uh, coming from rural area, working not only in big cities but also in the small of the area we are living in. So I think this is a way of changing places, uh, cities and uh, and small places are connected, and uh, the internet uh, um, don't have the same borders that we had earlier. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. I wonder how that seems in the Lebanon, but I think we might have lost Stefan. Are you there? Stefan, are you there? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Did you hear that last comment about um, making a world with no borders as following on from the web? I wonder if that's from your perspective how that seems. Well, well, if you can hear me, um, the, yes. the only thing I think about this uh, concept of borders is is the fact that uh, when you um, when you go on the on the web and you go on the internet, you feel like there are no borders and that everybody lives the same experience and everybody has the same kind of um, of interaction with the system. But I had the chance to live in Canada in the 90s and then to move to Lebanon and then I realized how how the, the experience, uh, a user experience can be very, very different in terms of... Oh. We'll hear more from Stefan in a minute when his, yeah, his Sue, connection re-establishes. Oh, Sue, you were, you were, very, you were nodding with that. What's... Um, do you have something to add to that? Yes. Yeah, so um, for Europeans and also and in, in in terms oh, of uh, in terms of oh, let's uh, go back to Stefan. Uh, go on. Yeah. I'm, yes. I, I was just saying that in terms of usage and also in terms of uh, interacting with the web. Um, in the 90s, I was, I was when I was in Montreal. There was a big um, issue with the, using the uh, the encoding provided by HTML to write French web pages and it, we had to develop our own HTML editor to actually create uh, web pages that would use uh, accents and, uh, and special characters. But when you come to a place like Lebanon and then you find out that other reasons uh, can motivate why you use or you don't use the web. And when we talk about borders, I would say uh, let's talk about um, a security and individual security. Um, now we heard about those um, problems with the NSA and the Snowden and everything like that. But uh, living in Lebanon where um, uh, I would say the democratic institutions are not the same as the rest of the world, and I think it's shared by many countries around the world, sadly. Uh, we, can, we can say that maybe sometimes when you post a comment on a, on a social network, you just have to, uh, to realize that you, you might get yourself in danger in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, I would say, personal implication into providing opinions or providing support to a cause or providing to support to a group. So. Um, I would say that the way we, you interact uh, with the web really depends on the language you speak, on the place where you are, and this is why it's true that uh, that there are borders on the web. And Whoop, lost him. Okay, Sue. So. <laughs> so I'll uh, yeah join in. I think the borders on the web are the border marker on the web. I would say is first the language. So for most Europeans and Americans, uh, English or you know other European languages are commonly shared, while for Asians the language barrier is quite high. So for Korean uh, web users, English is still uh, you know is a big hurdle. So uh, even though uh, most of the English content has to be translated, so in a way. You know, it uh, blocks. You know, it, it's a border. It's it's a hurdle, and uh, and we and but at the same time, uh, this uh, web technology has enabled crowdsourcing tremendously. So uh, the in Asia, the Korean drama Hallyu, uh, the Korean wave, Korean drama or Korean culture wave we call Hallyu is very big, and. Then you wonder how did they go over the language barrier, and it's all done by crowdsourcing. So a lot of people come in to do the translation voluntarily. 
So whenever a Korean drama goes on air, immediately after a team of volunteers chip in and do the, uh, is it, uh, what to call the, translation. You know, trans uh? translation. Yeah. translation and subtitle, right? They add oh, the translation right. subtitle and release it immediately. And I think it's just like the old Japanese manga subculture uh, uh, in old days, but it's done at just a scale that never was possible. Mm -hmm. And so there is barrier, but also the technology offers an easy way to go over the barrier. So it's it's very exciting, you know. The lang yeah. Stefan, you can go back to. <laughs> so um, what? Oh, oh Ste Stefan's disappeared again. Uh, Stefan's disappeared again. So from your point of view, um, uh, Sue, perhaps if we just stay with you quickly, what do you think the most significant thing that the web has changed, and uh, and what would happen in Korea if um, the Korean government tried to turn it off? Oh, um, I don't think we know how to live without it anymore. Yeah, I mean, life without the web is just not possible. Uh, newspapers, uh, most people, especially the young generation, all depend on news, online news. Um, and all the government service is often strictly web-based. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's going to be as bad as having, or even worse than having the martial law. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. How about yeah, mm -hmm. how about in uh, Norway? Um, what's the most? You mentioned retail a lot, I know, and banking, uh, and clearly being able to get to the shops without risking your necks falling over in the snow and ice as we would in Britain. <laughs> um, clearly that's an advantage, but what is there something that you nominate as the most important thing that the web has brought to you, and what would happen if it were taken away if you lost the web? I think um, I think the Norwegian society would have a quite big problem without the internet. Of course, for some time it will it will work without because uh, actually we are used to uh, stormy days and no electricity and when we have no electricity we have no internet but it's not so long time so um, but Norway is a quite cashless uh, society so we can't pay or anything for anything without the uh, internet I think uh, this is a, this could be a problem I think it would be some problems in healthcare too if there wouldn't be internet over many days. I think they have some security systems about this, but um, uh, a lot depends on internet. Uh, what yes. kinds of things in healthcare do you think? Uh, just to contact the doctor. <laughs> of course, if there is a really emergency, you, you take a telephone call, but otherwise, when we order a, a, time, a doctor time, then we go by internet always. Uh, we don't call anymore. Um, and they will, uh, public services, is very often on internet, and just if you want to apply for a job, for school, for kindergarten, everything is on internet. Yeah, and what, I wonder what would happen to places like Deeroy if there was no web anymore. Uh, I'm quite sure that uh, rural areas uh, will, in a way, disappear. People will, will move. And I think that's one of the main issues with internet, that uh, you may choose where to live. And you have the same possibility if you stay in a big city, nearly, than uh, living in a rural area. For instance, me having grandchildren, uh, for us it's, it's common to uh, eat uh, supper together with our small kids, living 200 kilometers away. And for them, it's natural to be on Skype or whatever 
talking to the grandparents through uh, this PC. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, the social interaction has increased a lot the last years, and it's very common to to have uh, in work, in healthcare, uh, in uh, job meetings, through internet. People are traveling less in some sense, uh, but are meeting more often. So if it's not possible, we have to move. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you raise that because one of the viewers who's, who's watching this, Emmy Sykes, asked, um, "How does the panel use the web for leisure?" Because most of you were starting to talk about work, but actually, Rangvald, when you were talking, you were not making so much of a distinction between work and leisure. It was much more integrated um, and sort of slipping between the two in the way that you use the web. Do you think that's right? I, I think it's right, and I think when you read uh, modern literature about the issue connected to, uh, to independent work, the new word, work, uh, workation, to combine work and vacation, then we, you can see it in work, and when going to Barcelona, there's 134 uh, co-working spaces, and a lot of people are, are mo mobile, they are traveling, they are working during their traveling to another place, or they are on occasion doing some work. Mm. And I think to understand how we, we are going to, to move or travel all the time, still doing our jobs, is interesting for the next 10 years. Mm. Uh, and I saw uh, one researcher said that um, in 2020, uh, more than 60% uh, will have independent work. It's more common to do the work where, uh, from wherever you are. And I think that what helps me and Ulrike in the top of Europe, to have, to have um, our second homes perhaps in New York or in Oslo or whatever. And it, it, it doesn't change because we do the work if we live here or in a big city. OK. Uh, Stefan. You've reappeared quickly. Can you? Um, we've been asked whether um, from uh, was this from Twitter um, about whether governments can actually turn the web off. Um, now clearly, your tech support seems to be able to turn it on <laughs> and off at will. But um, do do you have a do you have a, a, a perspective on that? That's you know sort of that's that's particular in your region. Yes, actually the question would be more, uh, is the government uh, capable of uh, putting it on? That would be a much uh, more interesting question. But um, I, I would say for Lebanon it's, uh, it's, it's quite weird because we have uh, the government as the um, monopoly on internet connections. So of course for, for some reasons they, they, could, they could stop it and they could uh, close the, uh, the entire Lebanese web. But uh, two years ago, there was uh, there was um, uh, they tried to, uh, to to create a law that would uh, allow uh, that would oblige every uh, web uh, website uh, to be um, registered by the government. So uh, this kind of things is much more dangerous to, than just having like a, a couple of hours of uh, of a blank web. But uh, we also. Uh, in in some situations, like in Syria, for instance, it was a, it was a, a direct weapon used by the government to uh, to at the beginning of the, the insurrection in in Syria. It was a it was a weapon that they could. Uh, oh, we've we've lost, we've lost uh, uh, yes, yeah, Stefan for the moment. Hopefully, we'll be able to to get him. But yes, one of our PhD students here uh, is a was a Syrian citizen. Uh, a blogger, in fact, and has uh, came here to do a PhD, has been unable to return, uh, and she's very familiar with the Syrian situation. It isn't just as Stefan was describing yeah. how... Um, I'm back. Uh, hello, Stefan. Yes, how yeah. taking the, uh, the web away was not the, uh, was not the worst thing that could happen, but in fact putting it back in place in order to monitor the activities of... Uh, yes, exactly of its citizens can be very damaging. So, sorry, I was, I was covering for you while you disappeared. Thank Is there you. something else you wanted to uh, add? Yeah, there's, there's also uh, something I wanted to say while my connection is still working. Um, 
for for many for many people in the world, um, uh, social networks, for instance, is a place for a public display of information. People display what they what they they, they want to 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 show on, of their own life. And sometimes it's the concept of private life is very present in the discussion and the debate on this. But if you live in a country like Lebanon, I would say the um, the, the the private life is much more in 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 at play in the social networks, meaning that uh, family life is public. Everybody knows you from your family name, or where do you belong, or what place do you stay, or they can tell from your name that how much money you have, or which which is your religion, what your beliefs. So uh, I would say the private life is public in Lebanon. So. Um, going online is is much more a display of private life. Like you can say, you can make your coming out, for instance, if you if you're from certain communities, or uh, this is the place where people show their real uh, who they are, uh, much more than than the, the the private family or. I think we think we've lost Stefan again. Let's uh, let's just go to to Stephen. Um, in Montreal, um, uh, your experience I in Montreal. Had something to, I had something to say about the questions that you've been discussing. Yes, please uh, do. I thought, I thought the replies by the other um, speakers were very good about what would happen if the uh, web disappeared. Uh, uh, if I could give an answer to that question from a cognitive standpoint. Please um, do. First of all, I. I think all the things that people said would happen will would happen, but they'd be reversible for the time being. In other words, there are it's recent enough, and there are enough people who who, who are pre-web, so that we could make a recovery uh, without the web. But I'm not sure that that's going to continue for much longer. The generations that were born and bred on the web have, how shall I say, they've they've uh, surrendered some of their cognitive capacities to the web. And if they do that in a critical period, it's not clear that they can claim them back. I'm thinking of things like uh, whenever you, if there's been an event in the past <clears throat> that you don't quite remember, but it has a web signature, you, you Google it to find out where was that, when was it, who said it. It, it, scholars use this and that's fine, but for ordinary life, it's something that you normally use your brain for. And if you get used to Googling it instead, your brain may no longer be able to uh, to uh, retrieve and 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 uh, yeah, but retrieve information that it had previously. And I think that's actually important, and no, uh, it should actually be studied. I wonder what the what the implications of that are. I wonder if that means that we should switch it off before we lose our cognitive capacities, or whether it means that we need to invest much more in it. Somebody has just asked a question in the UK context where a lot of money is going into building a big new railway network and someone's asked a question saying would we actually be better improving um, internet connectivity than building this big new railway network so in response to your comments Stephen I just wonder if it means we should get rid of it or if we should just try and secure it. Certainly not get rid of it but remember the critical thing was critical periods. There, In, in development there are periods that are particularly important if you don't use them then you can't then you can't make up for it later. There's critical periods for language, there's critical periods for attachment to your family and so on. I think that during the critical period for, for picking up, um, how shall I say, mathematical calculation skills, um, uh, memory skills, I think at those times the access to the web, especially in an educational context, should be controlled so that you're forced to use your, you know, a good analogy would be if you talked about transport, if we had transport that basically took us from everywhere to everywhere, including from here to the kitchen, we'd lose our muscles. Yeah. And I think uh, during the critical period it's important to, uh, to allow the muscles to be uh, used uh, lest they're lost. Mm -hmm. So it's about managing it in um, constructive and interventionist ways actually. I think so. Yeah. So um, shall, we go, shall we go for some uh, closing comments from uh, Sue Moon in Korea? Um, hello, Sue. <laughs> um, yes, from the point of view of um, the the uh, sorry the the government, you know, sort of can the government switch the web off? Um, uh, well, uh, we've we've got some questions about um, uh, yes, what will happen? I think Ragnvald said that the the regional read, 
um, okay. geographically disparate regions would would just disappear uh, without the web. That, that, that there's too much pressure to move into the cities, to move um, where the services are. Um, what would happen uh, in Korea if the web were to be switched off? You're asking a person who grew up in the bloody part of the, with the bloody part of the modern Asian history. So when I was in um, high school, up till high school, there was curfew from midnight till 4 a.m. And when I was in high school, middle school, we had the martial law declared and my cousins couldn't go to school. So martial law means uh, you are banned from going to your universities, also banned to move, and there was nighttime curfew. So like blocking information would, to me, feel like declaring martial law. Mm -hmm. uh, people cannot share what they need, but Korea is a very densely populated country, as uh, many countries in Asia. So I think there's going to be bloody revolt if you cut off web. Okay. Um, people just don't know how to, I mean, um, you complain about uh, the government manipulating information. So the Korean, in the Korean politics, uh, last presidential election, apparently the some government body or someone in power manipulated Twitter feeds and so and that's a huge issue and if you cut off the web man I don't I, I think it's just gonna be very very bloody on my part of the world okay it's, yeah <laughs> it's like oh no 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 they are not gonna just move okay it's just we want it back okay um. So, um, so let me oh, let me just bring the thing back to to us. We've been uh, it's been very interesting to see people's comments on the on the MOOC, on the the lectures that we've done, uh, and on some of the the discussions around most of the issues about about the web. How much of it is technology, and how much of it is what society has done with the technology? How society um, has responded. We haven't asked Susan about the, what has the tw last 25 years changed for you. I'm a computer scientist, and so um, you know, as the internet was being uh, created, you know, sort of professionally, uh, and as a student, we were we were there, you know, sort of really trying to understand this technology and use it in all its uh, un. Uh, it's unpretty glory, all of the command lines and the protocols. And it's worth remembering, actually, that the internet was a very American thing. There were different protocols, different kinds of networking going on in Europe, and it was very much the case that the internet won over what we were trying to do in the UK uh, and in the rest of Europe. Um, but all these, this wonderful sort of movement to uh, the online world uh, was very much just a part of what computer scientists and technologists, you know, we love to try this out, we love to fiddle with it. Perhaps you, would you mind saying how, how you came to the web and all of this technology? I think it's, I mean, I am one of those people who said that it would never take off, I'll admit to that. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a long time ago. Um, I mean, I think that rather than answering that question, the thing I would say is that I agree with what everybody has said very much, which is that it's here and it's here to stay. There's a politics of the web. There's a politics of who wants to control it, how it's going to be organized and managed. And I don't think that that is necessarily here to stay. And I think that one of, or at least the current settlement that we have is necessarily here to stay. And I think we take the web and the web that we have now very much for granted and perhaps we don't think about how it's become the kind of web that it is and what it takes to keep it in that place, Stefan's taking photographs. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important, Stephen was talking about the necessity to 
to think in quite an interventionist way and not just let the web carry on without thinking about the consequences of it. And I think we need to think about that both in terms of everyday life, around education and so on, participation, what it does to different parts of the world. But I think we also, as a sociologist, I think we need to understand much more about the technologies and the infrastructures that make it operate the way that it does at the moment and how that's changing over time and to be informed. I don't think we're very informed about the web and how and why it is like it is and that if we're going to keep it and develop it in ways that we would regard as progressive then I think we need to really inform ourselves much more about it. That's not quite the question you asked. But. No, but it's a much better one. Uh, <laughs> Uh, than, uh, uh, than I actually asked. So uh, I want to thank very much all of our participants, uh, all of our panelists who, are, uh, who, are, who have taken part for uh, to Ulrika and Ragnvald and their, their iPad in, um, in yeah. Norway, in Duroy, uh, Sumu uh, from Keist in uh, Korea, uh, Stephen Harnad uh, from Montreal uh, and uh, Stefan Bazan uh, from what? What is your? Sorry, we we couldn't remember the name of your university. Do forgive us, Stefan. Where are you based? Uh, Saint Joseph University. Saint Joseph. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we look forward to uh, to seeing everyone else. Uh, uh, um, some people will be coming along to our our face-to-face um, -face hangout, our, our MOOC up at uh, the University of Southampton this afternoon. We'll have some videos on the on the web for that uh, later. We hope. So thank you very much for joining us, and and see more of you soon in week two and beyond of our web science MOOC. Thank you.